And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie back here with Peter Sterling. Peter, you were going to talk about a 60-minute story, and then we'll go to calls. Oh, yeah. So, well, we were talking about heart therapy. And, you know, my early days, I I used to go play at the medical center here in the critical care unit, post-op, people all hooked up. And I'd I'd just sit down at the bedside and just start channeling, letting the angels play through me. And it it was amazing what would happen. All their pain would go away. Tears would come. And the doctors would follow me around. They'd be amazed at the response. And even the staff would just be so thankful because the – the, my music and playing the harp in there would just, you know, bring a calming influence. Sure. There were some studies done. We, there are several harp therapy programs in the United States where you can learn to play the harp and then use it therapeutically in different settings. Uh, but there was, uh, there was some studies done. They showed that, like, in the operating room uh, when a harpist was playing, uh, even when the patient was uh, under unconscious with anesthesia, when the harp was playing, the heart rate and respiration would go down. Uh, when the harp would stop, it would go back up. So even when you're unconscious, the nervous system responds to the harmonic tones of the harp, the strings of the harp, the vibrations of the harp, because our nervous system is like strings. And, and it, you can really tune people with the harp. That's what was done in the ancient temples of ancient Egypt. The harp was used with specific sacred tuning scales that, you know, could, could tune the body, could, could, you know, heal on all levels. And uh, it's just fascinating, you know, the whole world of sound healing. This is something I'm very much involved with. Peter, with the harp, can you play a song that everybody knows, or is it just a sound of the harp that's different? Well, yeah, you can play you can play whatever songs you want to play. Of course, uh, people read music. I play by ear. I don't. I'm not a trained musician, so I don't read music. I really don't know any music theory, hardly anything at all, and it frustrates some of my more trained music friends. But I just play from my heart. You know, that's how the angels taught me. That, that, that's that's what makes my music has that special touch. Is that I just play from my heart and soul, and I I couldn't tell you what I'm actually doing so much. But the, but people can feel that it has that that love in it, and that's to me that's the most that's the most important ingredient is with the tone of the harp is the love that comes through that comes behind it. Is it like a multi-stringed guitar? Kind of. No, it's more like a piano. Uh, the harp. So it's it's portable it's piano. Like, yeah, it's kind of like you know. And actually, if you open a grand piano. It has a harp shape. Remember that famous Marx Brothers smashed the piano and he takes Harpo starts playing the inside of a piano. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like the white keys of a piano, and the chromatic harp with the pedals has the black keys. But my harp is just like playing the white keys. It's modal. It's only one scale at a time. Even though I have some sharpening levers and I can I can do some alternative tunings, but basically it's just one key. It's just like playing the white keys and that's it. You, you know, most people could sit down with the white keys and just kind of putz about and make some pretty sounds. But the harp, just putting your hands on the strings and just strumming it, that, that classic glissando sound is what it's called, of just strumming a harp. That, that tone alone can, can, is a magical sound. And, you know, you just close your eyes and strum the harp like that. It can, it can really take you places. We're going to take your calls with Peter Sterling. If you have an angelic story you want to share with us, jump on board. We've had some incredible calls over the years, Peter, with uh, angels saving people and giving them strength when they need it the most. For sure. For sure. I know you've been an angel lover for a long time. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Do your fingers ever hurt playing the harp? Sometimes. Sometimes if I'm playing a lot. You know, you get calluses and uh, eh, not so much a little bit on the tips, but I play kind of with my nails too on my right hand. So you don't have like little face. rubber caps on your fingers or no. anything like that. I don't no, uh, I don't No, And, uh, no, nowadays it's, you know, my, I've been doing it for so long. Um, this, this year was actually, uh, this year was my 30th anniversary of my first album. My first album came out in 93. So I've, I've been doing it for 30 years, and it's kind of like I don't even have to have my eyes open. now. I can play my harp with my eyes closed, oh, and I can play, like, 
you know, kind of complex releases with my eyes closed. It just happens now. When Mozart did his thing, did he have a harp player with him? Mm. I haven't heard anything about that, but I do know that he was, I think he was, he had some angelic contact. Uh, so many of the great composers of that time spoke and actually wrote about being guided by angels. Uh, I think Bach wrote about that, um, or Beethoven, uh, Wagner was inspired by the angels. Yeah. And my, 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 my understanding is that, you know, the angels, they come like at a time to inspire humanity, like yeah. kind of out of the dark ages and then had that whole kind of Renaissance and, and so much of the great literature and art and architecture was inspired by the angels. And I think they're here now. I think more and more people are tapping in and, and there's a, an angelic invasion occurring they're here to help humanity, to help us to get us to the next level. They love and care about us, and and we have a divine destiny. I think they're really working overtime to lead us down the right path. All right, let's take some calls with you. Let's start with Sherry in Fredericksburg, Texas, east of the Rockies. Hello, Sherry. Hi, thank you, George. Yes, oh, Peter, I've heard your album, Heart Magic, and oh. George is right. It's vibrational. And here's yeah. here's my exposure to it. It was fabulous. Uh-huh. I yeah. heard I um I had a friend that did massage therapy in the early nineties, nineteen nineties. And and it was just beautiful. And then another friend of mine got her license here by practicing with to practice in Texas and she she came here to Fredericksburg uh to get her license and so I got she, I got to be she, you know, she, she practiced on me, so I got to hear it a whole bunch of times because she used the same music. Oh and, wow! Yeah, it was over. You know, because I get she'd give me like a, um, a massage for twenty dollars just so she'd have someone to practice on. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And, Lucky you. Yeah, it was me and another friend. We'd always come and, and be her guinea pig, so she could, and we got to listen to this music. And it's true; it's the vibrational thing. I do have a question, though. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the spirit guides keep us safe. I always thought angels did too, in their mm-hmm. own way. But um, there was a guest on Coast to Coast. I was wondering if you agree with her. Uh, she, she, she um, how can I say this? Uh, that she 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 believed that we came in um, with God during what we call the Big Bang, so we can connect with God and God can. Uh, well, it was Lorna George. I'm talking about Lorna. She wrote "Angels in Your Hair, My Hair." Yeah. And I said, she said that we're on a pedestal. As this is what I I need to get to first. She said we're on a. She believes angels have us on a pedestal, and I think, in, in my opinion, uh, they have us on a pedestal because we may have come in in the beginning, uh, during what we call the Big Bang, so we can connect with God through quantum physics because we have that ability, you know, to do that. Um, do you believe that we that we have this? Would you would you concur with that? I think I think as you're saying, what I'm getting is that. Um, there's something special about humanity within our DNA. Like we have a divine blueprint in our DNA that makes us kind of unique. It's, it'd be known as like the Adam Kadmon. Uh, uh, there's 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 a, a coding and a blueprint in our DNA that's unique to humanity, and this has a divine destiny. There's an unfolding. That's going to occur. There's going to be an illumination of this because the DNA is awakening. Of course, it's it's getting turned on, and so there's a divine destiny of like perhaps the next evolutionary stage uh, of humanity, which might be some people would call like Homo luminous. This could be connected to the light body, the luminous body of light, and this could be connected to the second coming. But this could be a collective experience with all of humanity or those who choose, can illuminate in this new radiance of light. This could be the next stage of human evolution. I believe we're going there rather than 
the other way, just completely demolishing, you know, humanity. You know, there's there's a, a grand divine destiny for us, and I I hook my my hat on that. I anchor on that light. That's what propels me in life and inspires me. And I don't get caught up in in the in the, the lower vibrations. Of, I have to keep really clear right now. And uh, the angels are charting, opening a pathway for us. That light is becoming clear. You just need to. How do you connect with it? Close your eyes, meditate, and look into the third eye, into that Christ center, the Ajna chakra there with your eyes closed. Listen to my music. Look there and look for the golden light. See the golden light on the inner planes, and that will illuminate your mind and your heart. The uh, angel lady, Peter, that she was talking about is uh, L- yeah. Lorna Byrne. I don't know if you know her. Or not. Lorna Byrne. I don't. You know, it sounds familiar, but I don't know we've met. I don't think so. The angels seem to reach out when we need them the most. Have you found that to be the case? I do. I, I think they're they're kind of like a an over a, a guiding spirit in us, and they're they're always kind of listening, you know, and they're always there for us. And uh, so many now, one of the she the Sharon who was just on, I think that was her name. She was talking, you know, guiding uh, spirit guides can help us too. Here's the difference, George, the way I understand it. Angels can actually interpenetrate into our reality. Like there's so many stories. One of my friends, Terry Lynn Taylor, who wrote 10 books on angels, she tells a story in her first book when she was losing control of her car as a teenager, early 20s and college days, going down the freeway in LA in the old oh, station God. wagon. She was going 80 miles an hour. Oh. The car started to swerve and something came into the car and actually hit the brakes and, and got control of that car. There's so many stories of, you know, like, Oh my God, I... being rescued and the angels can actually come in and do that. And they disappear. But I don't think spirit guides do that so much, but the angels, they can do that. That is miraculous. I had a call on this program years ago from a truck driver who was telling us an angel story Yeah, and yeah. he was driving on a very windy cliffy type road. It was just weaving all over the place. There were no barriers. So a bad turn, you're over the cliff. And he was falling asleep and getting drowsy Mm -hmm. while making these turns. And all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. he felt himself ready to go over the cliff. He had fallen asleep. He woke up and he was losing it. He was going to go over the cliff. And he said he saw a hand on his steering wheel. It wasn't his. Mm Mm-hmm pulled the truck back onto the road and saved his life. And he said, George, there was nobody else in the cab with me. I was, Mm -hmm. and and that was not my hand. Whose was it? I think it was an angel. (laughs) Amazing. Really is. Next up, Stephen, North Dakota. First time caller. Hi, Stephen. Hey, how's it going? Great. How about the uh, you? I'm doing good. Morning and the birds are chirping. Perfect. I hear them. Good morning. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry about that. That's right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to offer up a, a, a word of warning here. Uh, I've done a bit of research into demonology and kind of the occult, and uh, some of the tropes that you end up seeing with, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say a deal with the devil, but immediate success after, uh, or immediate success with learning an instrument or singing. Uh, you see right. that quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, just want to let you know to beware of that sort of thing. And, you know, you talked about cherubim. Uh, the evil one himself is a cherubim, and his favorite oh. instrument is a harp. And, I, you know, <laughs> God forbid I may say a servant of the Lord, right? All right. Well, Peter, have you ever one worried about the possibility that the demonic end would come in and trick you? I have thought about that. And, of course, that's a concern. And, you know, all I can say is like the what really convinced me is I saw the response from my music the, the the music that the angels brought to me and taught me how to play on the harp I played a very unique way very different than other harpists it's a, it's a certain quality to the way I play and because of the way I was inspired by these angelic beings that came to me and you know Jesus said know them by their fruit you know, like, look at the trail they leave behind. And 
my music has this beautiful trail of miracles wherever it goes. So many stories. People say it healed their cancer or a couple was trying to get conceive a child for years, did everything, and then they listen to my music and they conceive a child. Uh, just so many amazing stories like that. People were depressed for years and they listen to my music and now they're lifted out of depression and they're happy. You know, so I don't think that's the work of the devil. I don't think that's what the devil does or a negative force like that. I just see, I see beauty. I see love, miracles of love with this music. And that's all I have. I have to hang my hat on that. I have to believe in that. I have to have faith in that. Thinking in otherwise just would be too crazy for me. And, and it, you know, it's been an on the edge experience. And I have asked that question because people have, have told me what your caller just said, you know, and there are people that, you know, I want to make clear that I don't worship angels. I don't worship them by any means. I don't put them above God, the Creator, or, or Jesus at all. But they're just these magical beings that are here to assist us. And every world religion, in every holy book, speaks of the angels. They're everywhere. So they are a true yeah. phenomenon. And I'm not going to be afraid of them. I'm, I'm, I'm hooking in with the ones. I, I, I don't know about any evil angels. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, I know there's a lot of stories, but the ones that have blessed me in my life have just been pure loving beings, and they create miracles where they go. Good for and, you. And that's that's what I focus on. Joe in Monterey, California. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you for taking my call, George. Sure thing, Joe. George, he meditates a few hours a day every day. Yep. Because uh, uh, that's what it takes. Uh, uh, yeah. Peter. Uh, yeah. Working with sound uh, a great deal and working with angels because they will raise your vibration as well as the music that flows through you. Yes. Can you tell, can you tell um, uh, when a person is lying and when a person is telling the truth by the sound of their voice? Uh, I think we can – I have a sense for that, yes. Uh-huh. What's the purpose of that, Joe? Uh, well, the idea is that that sound, when we attune ourselves to sound or, or the light, um, right. we understand it on a very intuitive level, um, the aspects of divine spirit within mm -hmm. uh, the light or the sound in this world. So uh, we can actually um, see or hear things beyond uh, we something like – Understanding the wisdom or the truth of something, because that's what divine spirit brings us, and that's what it is. And working with the sound so much, uh, you travel with that sound probably into higher worlds as well. Oh, yes. Uh, are you oh, a absolutely. conscious dreamer? Yes, I am, and I, I, I visit a lot of people in their dreams. I guess I'm a, a dream traveler. And, uh, and, and, you know, we're talking about the sound frequency. Uh, I... Uh, it reminds me of, you know, my story is very similar. Remember that movie, um, August Rush, with Robin Williams? Classic. And it was the story about the boy who heard the music in the fields of Iowa in the sounds of nature. Mm -hmm. And then he became a great composer at Carnegie Hall. And that was kind of how it came to me. But also, as your, your caller was just speaking, that came to me. And one of the ways that I believe could be a sign that there might be an angel near you. And the way the angels communicate to me sometimes is that um, you'll often, I'll often get this high pitched ringing tone that will go off in one of my ears. Um, maybe it's usually the right side. Like a notification that they're coming. We're going to come back and wrap things up, Peter, and take final calls in no moment. And welcome back, George Norrie, along with Peter Sterling. We'll take final calls here. And, Peter, before we do, tell folks how they can pick up some of your music, sir. All right. So my website is harpmagic, H-A-R-P-M-A-G-I-C.com, and all of my music is there and all my social media links and links to Amazon Music, Apple Music, Spotify. It's all there. So just come to harpmagic.com. Check me out there. Has this ever been emotional for you when this all started? Yeah, it's 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 been emotional at times. I mean, I, I it launched like a rocket in my early career, but then I had some hard, challenging times, George. There was a period of time where I, I went into depression. I, you know, I kind of had suicidal thoughts. I guess oh, God, I imagined, Peter. 
I imagine like dousing my harp with gasoline and throwing it off a cliff into the Pacific Ocean, you know, and just throwing it all away. But no, I pulled out of that. You know, it's it's uh, it's not always easy on the journey, but it's it's so so worth it. Did you, you know? pull out of that on your own, or did you get some assistance? I did. I I got some assistance, and you know, my life circumstance changed, and things went on a positive. You know, I, I was tested. I had to. You know, there's a time where in my early career, George, where my van caught on fire, my harps burned to a crisp, and that's how I got out oh of the van. I, I didn't have a harp for six months, and I had to really do some purification and and uh, recommit to the mission, so to speak. And I, I didn't know if I had to play again, but it was my destiny to continue. Are there any so high schoolers who play the harp? High schoolers? Yeah, you know, there's a... There's a community more and more harps. You know, these harps I told you about, these harpsicle harps, they're, they're catching on all over, and, and, and you can strap them on. They have electric, and now young people are starting to discover the possibilities of a harp. So I, I believe there's a harp renaissance is uh, kind of occurring right now, so keep your eyes out for, for a harp somewhere. All right, well, let's go to final, final calls. Let's go to Matt in Bellingham, Washington, west of the Rockies, to get us started. Hey, Matthew, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, sure thing. So, yeah, I've had, I have several guitars, and I haven't played them in, like, more than a decade. And hearing this tonight, I'm realizing it's just the wrong instrument for me, and I really mm. want to check out these harps. Um, where yeah. where should I start looking? You know, there's harps all over the place. Just go on the Internet. Go on eBay. There's harps for sale. But I love these little harps. You know, you can get a harpsicle harp. Just search harpsicle harps. I'm giving them a plug right now. They're going to love this. Do you have to tune uh, them, Peter? Yes. You have to learn how to tune it. And you get a tuning key, and you get yourself a little electric chromatic tuner. And it's just, you know, it's pretty easy. It's not difficult, except there's a lot of strings, so you have to be patient. But, yeah, you have to you have to tune the strings. You want that harp to be in perfect pitch when you play it. You you had mentioned a foot pedal on the big harps. What are right. they? Well, those are those are um, the the pedals on the back of a classical symphonic harp. There's six pedals, I guess, or seven pedals. Really? And, yeah, and when you push the the pedal has three positions. So there's like the neutral position, there's a sharp position, and there's a flat. Position. What's it do? Tighten the string or something? Yeah, it, it's got like a it's got a when you depress the pedal, it pushes on the string and tightens it or loosens it, yeah. Okay, let's go to Al in Michigan. Take it away, Al. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? Okay. Doing great. Good. Peter, uh, the, your angels have told you that uh, the um, heart corresponds to the heart chakra, correct? Uh, I've, I've heard that, yeah. It's the harp and the heart. There's a resonance there, a connection for sure. Right, it's the uh, it's the chakra of love, and the color corresponds to the color of pink. Yeah, um, I've got a question for you. Have they ever talked to you about rock music? Your it's angels have they music. mentioned that? Like the effect of rock music? Anything about rock music? Well, what what they have they have talked about how some music that's more discordant can have like a like the angels' music, the way I'm doing it, it's kind of evolutionary. It creates like a positive spiral in the consciousness where it can elevate you and take you up to a higher plane of consciousness. But some music is like de-evolutionary, and it kind of spins you the opposite direction and can take you more into dark spaces, into the lower realms, into the lower vibrations. And I think you need to avoid that. Have you ever seen an angel, Peter? Many times, many, many times, many times. Do they, they have appeared. wings? What do they look like? Well, those were the ones that, it, yes, they, they appeared to me to have wings, George. The cherubs uh, described when I first saw them, you know, I saw them on the inner planes with my inner vision, and they were the little chubby baby ones that we see painted on the Sistine Chapel. And, and, and the, the wings were not like feathered wings. They were more like a, some sort of a, a propulsion system, a very high vibrating kind of energetic uh, part of their being that, that, that is behind them. I didn't see it like in the classical paintings, but it was more like a, 
a vibrating, some sort of a vibrating apparatus that would, could propel them. They would just zip all around. Yeah. And then there were times, George, in the, in the really when I was very open back in the early days where I would see them in the room with me. I, I, I used to play with them and I, I could actually put out my finger in front of me and I could sometimes see one lighting on my finger, a cherub. And it would look about two inches tall. Right, yeah, and there's this whole thing. How amazing. many how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? It's just all a matter of perspective. Let's go to Chris in New Hampshire, east of the Rockies. Hi, Christopher. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I was uh, going to talk about the wind harp. The wind yeah, it, harp. It, it, okay. Yeah, it used to be uh, up on a mountain in Vermont. Yep. And. Uh, my aunt took me up there, and it was like a a structure you could sit inside, right. and the wind would wind would blow through it and yeah. uh, make very weird sounds. Yeah. Well, those harps, I'm familiar with those wind harps. Uh, there was a, an artist who made them, and um, and those wind harps that were outside, they weren't necessarily tuned all the time. So a lot of times the strings were not perfectly tuned and that, that could make the tones a little bit weird sometimes but when i play the wind harp i tune the strings to perfect pitch and then when the vibrate when they vibrate because it's every string is playing at once it's kind of like white light and it's it's very powerful it's an ultra high frequency harmonic tone and when i play over people's body george or i can set the harp on the bow as the strings are vibrating and singing this heavenly tune, I've seen people release stuff out of their body, like stuck emotion that they've held their whole life, and they just burst out in tears, or tears just start streaming, and they're like, oh, my God, it's like you've lifted this burden off of me. And that's, that's the tone. That's the energy I work with with the angels coming through the wind harp. It really creates magical healing miracles for people with that sound. Peter, do you have to be particularly religious to deal with angels? I don't I don't think so. I mean, it's not necessarily a religious experience. It's more like a spiritual phenomena of the universe here. Um as I said, it's it's they're found in all holy religious books in every culture. So it's they're universal. Um they're not just belonging to one religion. So but it's more spiritual than religious. It's a spiritual experience to connect with the angels. It can be religious. Not necessarily does not have to be. It's more universal, and it, they connect you to a higher power that's probably even beyond religion. It's beyond, beyond. When you, when you get access into these realms, it's, it's really a mind blower. It really opens you up, and then you see the true reality. You get a touch, a taste of it, and can change your life. When you hear a harp player playing, a harpist, what do you think? Well, if they're if they're some of the classically trained harpists in the symphony that I've seen, they're so amazing, and I, I am nothing like that. I, I did they play with I'm two just, hands or just one? Two hands. We play with two hands, uh, but the classically trained harpists play in that classical style, and it's they're so fast and they're so precise. I play slower. My music is more dreamy, generally. It moves at a slower pace, and it, it's got a waveform into it. That's why when you come into res, it's very soothing. It just kind of rocks you. There's this soothing waveform in it, very healing. What has been the youngest harp player you've ever seen? Well, probably my son. My son. He plays? A 12-year-old. Yeah, I have a 12-year-old boy, and you know, he's been playing, he's got a harp, and I, I started him when he was, you know, a baby at two, and I have pictures of him playing my harp when he was a baby, very cute. Is he pretty good now? Yeah, he can, he doesn't play very much, you know, he's 12 years old, he's into playing his video games, you know, but uh, he, he's multi-instrumental, I've surrounded him with every instrument he has, he's pretty lucky. Can people sing with a harpist? Absolutely, absolutely, am I... My new album, um, Mystic Voyager, just launched on June 12th. It has I have um, three incredible vocalists that sing with me on this album, uh, and it's uh, lush vocals, and it's just so pretty with the harp. 
so so pretty. That's yeah, fantastic. I use vocals a lot. I sing. I sing on this album as well. I sing on most of my albums. I sing on some of the tracks, and I just use my voice like an instrument, not necessarily with lyrics, just layering what you call vocalese or vox, and it's just layering in the vocal tones to make kind of this rich, lush bed of sound. I love it. Peter, be in touch with us. Let's not let 11 years go by, okay? Let's not, George. I enjoyed this so much. Always a pleasure. All Thank right. you so Thank much you. for having me. Thank you so much. As I mentioned at the top of the program, we've got our affiliate back in Windsor, Detroit. It's in Canada. CKLW, The Big Eight. It was one of the first radio stations I applied for work back in 1971, a long time ago. But I got to know the name of their news director real well. He was a friend of mine, Byron McGregor, who has since passed on. But before he went, he left us something that was written by Gordon Sinclair that so many people have just loved, called The Americans. The United States dollar took another pounding on German, French, and British exchanges this morning, hitting the lowest point ever known in West Germany. It has declined there by 41% since 1971, and this Canadian thinks it's time to speak up for the Americans as the most generous and possibly the least appreciated people in all the earth. As long as 60 years ago, when I first started to read newspapers, I read of floods on the Yellow River and the Yancey. Who rushed in with men and money to help? The Americans did. They have helped control floods on the Nile, the Amazon, the Ganges, and the Niger. Today, the rich bottomland of the Mississippi is underwater, and no foreign land has sent a dollar to help. Germany, Japan, and to a lesser extent, Britain and Italy were lifted out of the debris of war by the Americans, who poured in billions of dollars and forgave other billions in debts. None of those countries is today paying even the interest on its remaining debts to the United States. When the franc was in danger of collapsing in 1956, it was the Americans who propped it up, and their reward was to be insulted and swindled on the streets of Paris. I was there. I saw it. When distant cities are hit by earthquake, it is the United States that hurries in to help. Managua, Nicaragua is one of the most recent examples. So far this spring, 59 American communities have been flattened by tornadoes. Nobody has helped. The Marshall Plan, the Truman Policy, all pumped billions upon billions of dollars into discouraged countries. Now newspapers in those countries are writing about the decadent, warmongering Americans. I'd like to see just one of those countries that is gloating over the erosion of the United States dollar build its own airplanes. Come on, let's hear it. Does any other country in the world have a plane to equal the Boeing Jumbo Jet, the Lockheed TriStar, or the Douglas 10? If so, why don't they fly them? Why do all international lines except Russia fly American planes? Why does no other land on Earth even consider putting a man or woman on the moon? You talk about Japanese technocracy and you get radios. You talk about German technocracy and you get automobiles. You talk about American technocracy and you will find men on the moon, not once, but several times, and safely home again. You talk about scandals, and the Americans put theirs right in the store window for everybody to look at. Even the draft dodgers are not pursued and hounded. They are here on our streets, most of them, unless they are breaking Canadian laws, are getting American dollars from Ma and Pa at home to spend here. When the Americans get out of this bind, as they will, who could blame them if they said, the hell with the rest of the world? Let someone else buy the Israel bonds. Let someone else build or repair foreign dams or design foreign buildings that won't shake apart in earthquakes. When the railways of France, Germany, and India were breaking down through age, it was the Americans who rebuilt them. When the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central went broke, nobody loaned them an old caboose. Both are still broke. I can name you 5,000 times when the Americans raced to the help of other people in trouble. Can you name me even one time when someone else raced to the Americans in trouble? I don't think there was outside help even during the San Francisco earthquake. Our neighbors have faced it alone. And I'm one Canadian who's damned tired of hearing them kicked around. They will come out of this thing with their flag high. And when they do, they are entitled to thumb their nose at the lands that are gloating over their present troubles. I hope Canada is not one of these, but there are many smug, self-righteous Canadians. And finally, the American Red Cross was told at its 48th annual meeting in New Orleans that it was broke. This year's disasters have taken it all. And nobody, but nobody, has helped. The late Byron McGregor from CKLW in Windsor, Canada. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDessore, 
Stephanie Smith, Chris Burrows, Tim Benall, George Knapp, and Ian Punnett. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.